Hello, my name is Tree Demon, and I'm the Devil Stockbroker. Thank you so much for tuning in to watch this video. Before we begin, please understand I'm not a financial advisor, and none of the following content is financial advice. The following content is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Trading stock carries inherent risk, and you should always respect and understand your own personal risk when considering any investment. Please don't take what I say as gospel, and please do not trade based on the information that I receive and share through my content. Thank you so much, and have a hell of a time in the stock market. All right. Hello, everybody. This is True Demon, the Devil Stockbroker. This is our professionals meeting for May the 1st. Um, had a few technical difficulties getting into this one, but uh, we're, we're all set to go now. Let's go back to uh, what we were discussing earlier with uh, AFib, Acutus Medical. We were looking at the, uh, the change in momentum for the stock. It looks like it's getting ready to chase a gap fill here at uh, 150, uh, 155, 160, mm. up to the gap at uh, 190. That's actually not bad. It's already made a 100% run, so I'd be looking to see if it retraces. It's about ready to touch this resistance that it had in pre-market back on, uh, what was this? This was April 27th, pre-market. So if we see some resistance here at 144, it could sell off in the morning and reestablish a higher low on this trend. And then I would be setting my limit there to try and pick up shares. I'll go back to what everybody else was pointing out. That uh, the uh, short exempts on this particular ticker were pretty juicy. The short exempt volume is making up uh, about 1% of the total volume. It actually made up. Two and a half percent on uh, April twenty sixth. So this is a very thinly traded stock normally. And let me go double check my uh, trading view stats on this one. It says that it's got a uh, about a twenty two million share float on trading view. So. What's this? Uh, if we look at the short exempts traded by the free float, we've got 147512 divided by 22 million. A little more than half a percent of the float was traded in short exempt volume. It's not a lot. 7219. But three, <laughs> three times the float was traded on April 27th. So three times the float. That's ridiculous. 3.28% three, 3.28 3 times the float was traded on April 27th. Something big happened. Something fundamental happened to this company. So let's go take a look at their filings and see what else uh, what else turns up. I've got to log into this. Any news? That's what I'm wondering. That's what I'm wondering. Six days after the mirror. Six days after the mirror. So the mirror took place right here. It's so weird how this indicator works so frequently. All that it's really saying is that the sudden change in the short exempt volume from two short exempts up to four and a half thousand 
was a significant change. And you also see the drastic shift in the five-day simple moving average delta because it made a move by about, um, what was this, from 85 cents to 96 and a half cents. It's like 9%, 8%. Hmm. But yeah, this this is accumulation of some kind and market makers are fulfilling the buy orders so somebody is interested in whatever's going on here. Let's investigate this a little bit further. What do they do? The uh, company itself, from what I understand, um, let's go ahead and check out their description on TradingView. So they engage in the development of medical devices and electrophy equipment. It creates electrophysiological mapping systems for the treatment of cardiac arrhythmias, such as trial fibrilla atrial fibrillation and ventricular tar tachycardia. The company was founded by Randall L. Werneth and Christopher Scharf in 2011 and is headquartered in Carlsbad, California. All right, so... Yes, but <laughs> I, I at least understand this much. Um, so they're looking, they're trying to use um, electrical Everybody mapping systems. Happy. Yeah, it, it's Everybody it's to happy. map out the it's to map out the uh, the rhythms of the heart for diagnostic purposes. It looks like. Yeah, that's why I use fibrillators. That's that's the play on their ticker AFib. It's yeah. ventricular fibrillation. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. Uh, I like the uh, <laughs> atrial fibrillation. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I like the, uh, I, I like it. Okay, so looking at the technicals on this one, the stock itself is making, during the regular trading session, is making big swings up and then selling off in the mornings. And it looks like the uh, momentum reverses by noon Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. So by about uh, so by about lunchtime is about the time to buy it, according to this. But this one traded a little bit differently on the twenty eighth, but it did have a big sell off. I imagine profit taking was part of that, but also probably somebody trying to average down their positions. So maybe they just took a big short, slammed the price down during low volume, and then picked it up before noon. So if this is the same, yeah, okay. It, it trades the same way every day, just about. So what I'll expect, what I'll expect is that this thing will sell off first thing in the morning. If we have any luck, this pattern will repeat itself and it'll sell off and try to touch this trend again. So let's find out where this thing is going in extended hours trading. Okay. All right. Yes. Very good. All right. So what I'm going to expect for it to do is starting at 930 in the morning, it's going to try to sell off down to touch the trend again by uh, noon. I'm going to set this trend line so that when it crosses this at any point at 1230, Okay, so we've got our trends set up here. It's not really a trend so much as it's a timeline trigger.
Okay. All right, so if it breaks this horizontal trigger, If it breaks this before noon, then that means that it is deviating from trend to the upside, so it's likely to change its pattern. If it triggers this alert, then AFib is sticking to its trend. All right, so we got it. And then if it breaks down below this trend, then it's bearish. Complete break of trend to the downside. We want AFib to go into AFib. <laughs> right. <laughs> But we'll see what this does tomorrow. I'm betting that if it bounces off of this trend line before noon and then starts to make its way for this, then that'll be the buy signal. Um, pay, a clo pay close attention to this one because it's moving, it's moving strangely. It's deviating from its normal patterns. Um, but this one could be uh, this one could be a runner. It's behaving erratically, at least compared to its uh, to its previous behaviors. The OBV does look like a P wave too, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, one more look at the at the short exempts. It is throwing a series of squeeze signals. I want to look at the. Or text just to see if there's any shorts on this one. I'll, I'll go ahead and log into this. Give me a few seconds, guys. Makes sense. You may use it for other analysis today, anyway. So. There's another gap fill from 480 to 650. On AFib? Really? We're going to want. Interesting. 11.8% of free float and the short interest is climbing. What's the on loan doing? Mm. Interesting. Shares on loan versus the short interest are deviating? What? The on loan is half of what the short interest says. Do you see this? Why is the on loan so low compared to the short interest? There must be a private that lender. Doesn't make it. How does that happen? I don't know. This shouldn't be possible. The on loan well, shares they're, they're has to be higher yeah. than the short interest. You would have thought that their mod, like whatever model they've got, would at least account uh, for that. I mean, that, that is an edge case. Look at yeah, the lending ask, volume, too. Should we ask Peter about it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to ask him about it. There was almost a million shares in lending volume by itself in the last two days. That is so bizarre. That doesn't make sense. We're gonna Come look in. We're gonna wa we're gonna put this one on a watch list. AFib needs to be paid attention to. Can they borrow shares from insiders that aren't in the float? That is possible. I mean, that would explain it because if they're not being tracked by uh, if they're not being tracked by a broker dealer, 
because the on loan shares the on loan shares are what are being tracked by prime brokers. Yeah, you're right. So that that's not an estimate, is it? That's that's the actual figure. It's not. Yeah, so, yeah, that, it does make sense. That, it does make sense actually, doesn't it? And the exchange reported short interest is higher than the estimate. And it's still three times the size of what's on loan, according to Wait, this. What? Yeah, the exchange reported short interest. Look at that. The exchange reported short interest is one point six nine million. Right. And the on loan at that time was four hundred and fifty nine thousand. That shouldn't be possible. This is this is weird. No, We're no. gonna put a watch on this one. Something is going on with this particular stock. The utilization is still really low, but it's peaking quickly. Somebody's taking out big borrows against this one. I don't know who's fucking with it, but somebody is. I think this is one to uh, take a position in, in shares. I wouldn't suggest options. If there are even are options on this one, I don't think that there would be. It's been trading too far below $3. But we'll check that out just to be sure. Uh, there are options on APIB. There are options. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We will we will look at this one again later well actually one more one more dd check let's take a look at the options heat map you'd have to think that it'd have to be an executive that would be loaning out his shares that aren't in the flow yeah i would i would have to agree with you Interesting. But even so, I think that, that I think that means if that was the case, I think that means that well, uh, the, uh, the, my understanding at least of uh, those values is not currently correct. It would put them in the float if they did that, right? Yeah. It would dilute the float because you'd have a bunch of shares that were sold short into the market, then inflating the float from insiders. There, It has to be explicitly written somewhere into an 8K or a 424B prospectus. It has to be disclosed that the insiders are permitted to lend out shares for borrowing. If they are doing that, it has to be written in. I'm on it. I'm checking out the options interest, but uh, this is this is pretty tall interest. The short squeeze and gamma squeeze bot shows that uh, there's not very many options on the chain. Yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. The December's for this year, December sixteenth. Going up to five dollars are pretty uh, are pretty big. Let's see what those are selling for. They're thirty five cents on the ask for the two and a half dollars, and thirty cents on the ask for the five dollars. There's not many of them being traded though. It's a very thinly traded option. October's look a little bit better. There's over a hundred and eighty on the ask for sixty five cents, which is interesting that they're cheaper on the December's. What's the spread like on them? The spread's huge. It's a difference of 50 cents. 40 cents, I'm sorry. Oh, we wouldn't touch that, I don't think. Yeah. For, and that's for October. Um, probably during the trading day, the spread will update, but there's a there's a 20%, there's a 20 cent spread on, uh, on the December's. The thing, the thing is, well, look, when you've got such low interest in them, there, always the risk you get trapped in it. Yeah. Which just happened to me enough times for me to 
<laughs> that tends to happen with um, that tends to happen with leaps, but you're looking at six month um, six month quarterlies. So that one, if this starts moving, you would get plenty of interest in those, especially if they ran in the money at twenty two dollars and fifty cents. Um, but the options interest just isn't here right now. We'll have to watch this one. I think the short interest is going to climb on it, and I don't know if I would start taking a position right now. It's more likely that shorts are going to hammer it in the short term. That's my take. But I will be watching it because as the short interest climbs, so is the utilization. And if there's something fundamental that's going on to improve the outlook of the company, then sell left hard access portfolio to Medtronic signs debt refinancing deal with Deerfield. Ah, this is the news that got everybody's attention. Yeah. Pushed it by 23%. Okay, what day is the news coming out? Yeah. Okay. okay. So they're refinancing their debt, which is good outlook for them. But in the near term, willing to bet shorts will push it back down. So I'm going to say we hold off. That's my take. I want to take a look at ADN next. Um, this was also on the radar. This is another micro float, I think. 26.24 million shares on the float. It's trading at support. It's touched this four times. And it was stop loss hunted on the third uh, on the third time that it touched it before it went into consolidation at this level. We saw this with BQRS, uh, BRQS, excuse me. So one downtrend here and then a rebound, then back into a downtrend, big rebound, downtrend, stop loss hunt, and then consolidation at this $2 level. So this is a big area for it. And based on the trend that I had established, there's a channel where at any time it could start moving towards it. If we look at it on a fan, let's take a look at the GAN fan. The most likely trajectory, which is the one-to-one, -one, will place this at the top of the trend line by the 18th of July. The likelihood that it stays in consolidation for this long. Let's see. If it doesn't break below a dollar ninety and it stays in consolidation, then it seems like the most likely outcome for this particular ticker will be for it to establish uh, or retest this channel's top by August. You know, but there's volume coming into it. This OBV is uh, this OBV is interesting. Hellish divergence. They just hosted Hyundai at their offices Tuesday. Yeah. This is likely to get some other investors' attention. Let's go ahead and take a look at the short exempts on ADN. Get an update there. Go clean this up a little bit. Oh, whoops. ADN on the NASDAQ. There we go. Sixteen and a half percent of the float is shorted. It is rising sharply. Ah, uh, I hate when I forget that. 
Okay. Let's get rid of the exchange reported and the short interest of the float. Yeah, shorts hammered this one. They pushed it down, and it got back down below the $2 level. So all these guys got in at uh, probably anywhere from 3 to $4. So we'll just estimate that they got in at about 375. Give it a happy medium. A big spike of failures to deliver here. That's interesting. Utilization is 100%. Oh, uh, yeah. Good point. Yeah, cost of borrow skyrocketed too. Okay. I think I know what happened here. I've started to figure out the correlation between cost to borrow jumps in utilization and a sudden move like this. This is shorts getting forced to getting forced recalled on their shares. So they have to buy back and then they re-enter at a higher cost to borrow. So this is brokers negotiating shorts positions for them. I suspect because normally the broker handles this for the short seller. If the short seller wants to accept a higher, uh, a higher uh, cost to borrow fee, then the broker will negotiate it. They'll shuffle the shares around in the inventory and then they'll reset the short position, but they don't reset their customer's short position. They just take the difference in the cost to borrow for those days uh, in order to cover their costs of reshuffling the positions. That's what I suspect happened here because you look at the on loan had a sudden drop. So there was a recall and then it spiked again two days after, which that's two days settlement and the cost to borrow scaled up big time at the same time and utilization increased by how much was this? It went from 64% to a hundred in a matter of four days. So that's two uh, two day settlement plus another two day settlement period. That's the perfect timeline for a short recall and then a reshort. So they doubled down, pushed it all the way back down to its original position, where it uh, managed to get shoved down to two dollars and twenty cents. What I suspect is this is actually bulls getting scared and recalling their shares so that they could sell, and then you have this situation where bulls are selling while it's high and the short recall brings in shorts that are willing to pay a higher cost of borrow fee to hit it again. And at the end of the day, the bulls get out at a better price and the shorts enter, they re-enter their position at a better price. But there's a little, it's like a little squeeze that happens. And now it's back down at support again. So this one actually has some potential. That's my thinking here. I'm going to take a look at the, uh, oh, let me, uh, let me get the short exempt uh, data up here. Oh, all they got hurt was a couple days of cost to borrow. Interesting. Short exempt volume hasn't really peaked yet. That's not a lot. It's a very thinly traded stock, but market makers aren't facilitating most of the trades. Otherwise, we'd see... Otherwise, we'd be seeing a lot more short exempt. Mm, yes. I like it. Let me go back a little bit in time. Uh, do another inspect on ADN. And we'll take this back to April Fool's. In the meanwhile, let's go look at Fintel. So all the shorts really only got hurt by a couple days of a higher cost to borrow. Right. That's that's what I'm thinking. Some of them might have gotten squeezed out of their position because they didn't have they didn't get recalled, but then the price moved up on them. But if they've been in their position for a long time then they probably didn't really feel it. At least I wouldn't think so. Especially when you look at this chart. Well, most of the shorts I would suspect have been getting in in this uh, for quite a while. So if they piled in on it, let's go look back at the average days on loan. I'll take away some of this stuff. 
if we look at the average days on loan, before this happened, the average days on loan was 71. So shorts have been holding on to this for at least several months. We're going all the way back here to the beginning of time. Yeah, probably like $9, $10-ish. There was a big increase here during this period. The price was rising and a bunch of more a bunch more shares went out on loan during this period i might suspect that uh, shorts have been holding on to this for a long time they may have been punishing this stock since the beginning for all we know it's been on the threshold list a couple of times lots of shorts got in here yep just like i suspected between 15 and 10 dollars that's where most of the shorts negotiated their positions and they've been in it for a long time since March of last year. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, if the stock turns around, the shorts that have been in for a long time might be looking to get out of their positions. Uh, any shorts that piled in down here would start to hurt. They might start to feel the pain. But this is going to depend uh, on retail taking an interest in this one. So we'll have to look for additional cases for this other catalysts um ah i see there's dilution on the table okay aggregate of 10.15 million shares of stock consisting of 5 million issued to fer fisher at the roller I probably butchered that name. And five million to other selling security holders. This perspective prospectus also covers additional securities which may become issuable by reason of share splits, dividends, or other similar transactions. We will not receive any proceeds from the sale of shares of common stock by the selling security holders pursuant to this prospectus. Okay, that's bad. This is a bad dilution. It's going to increase the float and the company is not going to receive any of the proceeds. The warrants were worth 42 cents. Mm. We have to give this one time, fellas. This one's got to percolate. This stock is getting hammered right now, and I think the shorts are still in control. The volatility in it is nice, and it did have a big move, but that's only because a big share recall occurred. Or shorts were getting out and it caused a bear rally and then bulls sold while they had a chance and bears piled in again. So this one's going to end up becoming a short squeeze candidate later, but there needs to be fundamental catalysts and there needs to be uh, interest in the company once it reaches a better uh, once it reaches a better price I don't think it's a candidate right now I think it's gonna take time so my guess is it'll continue to sell off it's probably going to go back down and test the bottom of this channel again so or rather no it can't that would be that would be There's below options. zero come again what's that num there's options. There's options? Uh-huh. You can play the downside. Yeah, you could play the downside. I think it'll enter into a falling wedge if this pattern emerges. I'd be looking to see if it creates an emerging pattern here with this falling wedge. If it touches this...
and this is earnings. So does the bot automatically send that out to you? What you pro? What you? I'm sorry. Say say that again. If it hits that level, is does that automatically send out the message? Yeah, yeah, that will send out the message. That way, you don't need to manually keep an eye on it. For the right. Mind. This will just let us know. We should pay attention to it. Yep. <clears throat> It'll let us know to pay attention. So if it crosses this trend line before the uh, before this date, then we know that it's entering a potential bullish uh, bullish channel. It might make a chase for the top. Uh, or if it breaks down below it and then crosses this line, which is going to be the morning of earnings day. Actually, I'll bring it a day before. Um, that way we'll get early warning eh, two days before. So we'll check this again, two days before earnings. We'll see what the price is doing. We'll see what, whether it's established a new trend or if it's consolidating still towards this line. And if it is, then yeah, we will, uh, we'll get an alert. Okay. Let's go check out some of the other tickers. I know you guys have been paying attention to uh, to quite a few plays. Uh, there was an agenda that was set up here. I'm going to go ahead and add some of these really quickly. Let's see, ADN and AFib. Um. Uh, I'll tell you what I am looking at right now, actually. So the housing market has been in a really shit position right now. And what I've noticed is that direction daily real estate bear three times leveraged shares are starting to increase in interest. This is a huge accumulation for shares and call options on this. This is an index that follows bearish. Um, it, it basically is a short ETF against the housing market for residential and REITs. So if the housing market takes a shit, then this thing's going to move ridiculously fast. If you take the la latest example, when COVID, when the COVID scare happened and caused the crash, in a 30-day period, this thing moved 230%. So call options on this, if you time it right, can be absolutely massive money makers. Right now, this thing is trading for about the same price on options as the SPY. Um, so this is attractive if you're bearish on the housing market like I am. I'm looking at this one pretty closely because I, I'm, I'm waiting for the perfect timing. This is going to be so hard to do, but I'm waiting for the perfect time to buy November 18th call options on this ETF so that I can catch the housing market crash. You'll notice that there's a huge amount of shares that have grown in interest on this just in the past several days. That is because the housing market is not looking healthy right now. Um, we've got mortgage interest rates rising at a historic rate. The inflation rate is through the roof, which... Um, that's going to affect absolutely everything, but especially cheap goods. So companies like Dollar Tree, Walmart, um, Dollar General, uh, any discount stores, storage utility stores, um, think like Extra Space or uh, or U-Haul um, or uh, even Avis Budget, that's Ticker Car, even they have storage solutions and they own a company called Budget Truck which is uh, big moving trucks and they're they're global also so that's going to uh, that's going to have a heavy effect uh, on this market you'll see moves in those particular tickers as well just like what happened before I wish I had listened to myself when I said that Avis budget was going to go nuts once they recovered from covid if I had I would have probably like more than 
quintupled my money. Um, but you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda. Anyway. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You look at cars, you, you can take a look at what car did and you just like, it, it makes you. Who's car? Car is uh, Avis Budget Group Incorporated. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You look at this company, this is what it did. COVID, it was down to like $19 and at the peak of, uh, in the peak of November, it was 357. Everybody thought that this company was going to drown, um, but it survived, and it it it's ridiculous what the price went to. I would have been a rich bitch if I had listened to myself. Yeah. Do we need the J. Um, Ruff's other half on? Yeah. Well, anyway. Um, Avis Budget Group is uh, one to take an interest in. Um, but at this point, I think the company may be overvalued. So in the event of another crash, then this one may lose its value quickly. And during the recovery period is when you want to buy these. Because just like just like companies like <clears throat> just like U-Haul... During the uh, during the 2008 subprime crash, U-Haul was one of the fastest recovering and one of the largest recovering uh, stocks because the demand uh, for their uh, for their services was so high as people were forced to move out of uh, out of their homes and yeah. you know when the eviction, when the eviction ended, right? yeah all of that stuff affected yeah. Yeah, exactly. So all the moratoriums on all of this stuff for like the COVID protections is going to end. And when when the real pain hits the average consumer during what's about to come, what I suspect is people are going to be forced to move out of their homes. So the whole housing crash is the lead up to something like this. So when the housing crash takes place, you ride the trend down, shorting it all the way. Um, or you take you buy calls on a bearish leveraged um, index if you want to do it that way. That's how I'm choosing to play it. Um, but you ride that crash and you take big short positions on the way down and try to catch those waves. And then trying to find the recovery period. I would say that by the time the SPY has hit its worst point in... Uh, I, I think that the SPY is going to fall by anywhere from 50 to 60 percent that's that's how negative i am on my outlook for the market in the future i think that the market is going to collapse on itself the weight of this all of this money against the market with rise of inflation is going to absolutely cripple the average consumer and i really hate taking this doomsday approach uh this doomsday mindset but can you repeat that uh, 3x housing market short? Uh, DRV, okay. DRV, DRV, Direction Daily Real Estate Bearish 3x Leveraged. It popped on Friday except for the pullback after hours. Right. Did we have housing reports this week, I thought? There were housing reports, yeah. The mortgage, in, uh, the mortgage interest is out of control. The interest rates are rising so quickly, and um, Wells Fargo, I think it was, just let go about 30% of its workforce, most of them in mortgage negotiations, so they know what's coming. The housing market is going to crash. It is going to crash. What about the new DTCC haircuts? That, I think, is also going to affect it since the DTCC is going to be pulling back uh, leverage on... Um, they're, they're not going to allow for um, double A mortgage-backed securities to act as collateral for uh, margin equity, meaning that uh, if you have... If you're a big bank or a big hedge fund and you bet long on mortgage backed securities for trip for double A. These are the third these are double A twos. Um were no longer considered collateral collateral 
assets for margin accounts, which translates to the third best rated mortgage backed securities in America are no longer acceptable as uh, as margin equity. It no longer I mean, counts I'm towards your margin bottom line. So they gave them a 100% haircut? 100% haircut. It is no longer it is no longer a marginable security. It does not add to your margin equity. This is going to cause margin calls in the market as well. So uh, any big bank or fund that is holding those MBS are no longer going to have them propping up their margin equity. So this is going to cause their margin to drop massively. Uh, let's actually take a look at MBS right now. This comes into effect tomorrow. No, the new rule. How is your is that right? All equities got a twenty-five percent haircut right off the top. Pretty much. Just tomorrow, yeah. For anything above five dollars, that includes Facebook, Amazon, all the big players. Can you hear me? So I, there, I can hear you, Dave. Equity. Just checking. I, I, I turned push the talk on, so I wasn't. I'm not sure. Okay. The, this, this is tomorrow. This rule comes in the, the haircut. Yep, all um, of it. So this is what MBS. This is the MBB. Um, this is the ETF, which uh, represents the largest buckets of mortgage-backed securities. It's in a falling megaphone right now. This is this is a this is an incredibly bearish pattern that this is doing right now. What is this? This is MBB. This is the Mortgage Backed Securities Vanguard ETF. This represents the biggest basket of mortgage backed securities as an ETF index in the world. And it is falling rapidly. It's been falling since January. So these represent the basket of mortgages which are bundled into MBS and then. Uh, placed against this index, and now this is going to get a huge haircut with a hundred percent drop in equity for anything that is a double A two mortgage backed security and below. They're not going to be worthwhile as a collateralized asset, which doesn't add to margin. Which means one, it's not going to prop up hedge funds uh, margin accounts anymore. They're going to lose margin equity. Two, these are since they are no longer useful as margin equity, they become worthless as a hard asset. These are normally considered just as good as a mortgage. It's basically like owning a house for every MB. Well, it's basically owning a basket of houses and collecting money on the premium for the loans, along with interest and yield. When the hedge funds realize they're holding a huge chunk of these that are worthless to them as an asset for holding up their margin equity. They are going to dump them. And when that happens, this ETF is going to fall rapidly. And by the time anybody realizes it, there's going to be margin calls against the hedge funds that were left holding the bag. Because not only is the margin equity gone for these, but the actual equity value is gone too. Because nobody's going to want to hold on to these if they know that they're not able to use it for margin equity. They're going to put it into something else. Probably something like a hard asset like gold or actual property. But more than likely, they're going to look to put it overseas. Of course, if you've got um, NFTs or crypto, you can always... Get a uh, DeFi loan <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to get le leverage when, without uh, your broker uh, allowing you to put your house up for, for collateral. I don't know. I'm honestly not confident that the NFT market is going to hold itself up when this I was, really. I think there's going to be. I think there's going to be. I think there could be a. a a short-term push because of the do you, know, do you know the drama that happened last night with the other side board ape stuff no i don't know anything about that okay i can talk about it later if anyone's interested okay um 
or now or so. I don't know. <laughs> well, I would like to get through uh, all of the other uh, oh, yeah, tickers that list. everybody yeah. requested. Yeah. So let's see what else. Uh, what else did we have to talk about? I've I've talked enough about the bad market. Um, I think that this crash is coming sooner rather than later. I think now is the time to leverage a position for November for the market to crash. You could bet against the spy, or you can bet calls on direction uh, real estate shares um uh or real estate bear shares i should specify um or something else but whatever happens this market is this market is way too heavy i've looked at the spy and it's it's still on track with the 2008 crash only this one's much worse because the market is even more over leveraged than it was back then So how do you think this will affect the, like AMC, which is supposed to have anti-bias? Uh, um, you you're talking about through? negative. You're talking about negative beta. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Bias is beta. There is the potential for this to have the opposite effect in AMC because the um, because the margin equity of the uh, of the shorts will be evaporating, then their short positions will become increasingly untenable. So it could have the opposite effect in AMC because the AMC holders are just, they're just long in the stock no matter what. They refuse to sell, but most of those are cash buyers. So they have all of their equity in AMC shares. And this is actually proven that Fidelity and uh, Fidelity, CompuShare, or um, not CompuShare, uh, Fidelity, Interactive Brokers, Schwab, and there was one other one. It might have been, um, I don't want to misspeak, but it may have been, uh, it may have been Morgan Stanley's E-Trade. I can't, I, I'm not sure. Um, but there are multiple brokers that are requesting available shares for loan for AMC, GameStop, and ATER specifically. They are really desperate for people to put their shares on loan and I think that's because the equity of the, uh, I, I think that the equity, the margin equity of the shorts is becoming thinner and thinner and the cost to borrow is rising faster than they can, uh, than they can recover funds by shorting the stock and pushing it down. We've reached a level where it won't fall any further. It just refuses to go any lower. And I think that what might be happening is the shorts that have, they're desperately trying to acquire more shares to short against the AMC holders, but most of them have wised up. There's no more shares in inventory anymore. The DTCC is giving haircuts to all kinds of equities, so the margin requirements are lifting rapidly. And most of the AMC apes are they're cash buyers anyway. They're not on margin. So for them, it doesn't matter. They don't care. And like me, I'm a cash buyer. I don't have any margin anymore. Me too. So you've got people that are holding a combined set of like 500 million shares of this AMC stock, which is shorted by 20% if you go by the numbers on Ortex, but it could be much higher if it's naked shorted. And the DTCC is going to have to reconcile that missing money. It's got to come from somewhere. Otherwise, this is going to cause a massive liquidation event in the DTCC and all of the other partners of the DTCC, all of those other partner organizations that are facilitating the liquidity, they're providing their, their equity for different types of assets to the DTCC so that they can reconcile these missing assets. They're going to have to pull money from somewhere. They're going to have to negotiate that somehow. And eventually it's going to come to the point where if nobody is willing to sell GameStop, AMC, ATER, the other meme stocks that are set to squeeze like this, they're just going to be like, fuck it. Whoever is shorting these stocks, you need to get out of your positions right now and then total fire sale. So if the spy starts crashing rapidly from all of these assets depreciating and the mortgage-backed securities falling out of their uh, margin equity, then the, op the opposite can happen to AMC because it forces shorts to close out their short positions because shorts are a margin position. No matter how you slice it, shorts are always a margined position because yeah. yeah. you, you cannot place cash collateral yeah. down against a borrowed asset. There was that rule from the DCCC about that was designed to 
um, stop fire sales? Do you remember what number it was or when it was supposed to come into effect? Oh man, I I don't remember. Uh, yeah, that was being talked about like a month ago. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. For a while, was it double oh five? Maybe. I was supposed to take months ago, and then they were revising it. It didn't go through, so this is like a revised version they were proposing. And yeah. I don't know. Actually, it was the one that we met. It was the one where we bonded on True Demon. Oh, the the remember? old one. That was NSCC twenty twenty one dash zero zero five. I was screaming at you that your DD was wrong. Yeah, I remember until, that until you heard until you heard me, and then realized I was right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you were totally right about that. It was NSCC twenty twenty one dash zero zero five. Yeah, that's where that's where we met. We, we we truly met. Yeah, yeah, that was when it was you and Vigilant Watch that yeah. were correcting me. Yeah, I remember that clearly. Good times. I've never been so happy to be wrong about something. <laughs> well, it really, yeah, I mean, it really did lead to an enlightening for me. All right, so well, it, led to, it led to a great um, collaboration as well. Yeah, yeah, it did. We ended up being, we ended up as a result of the findings, we ended up being spot on for, uh, as a result of all the research that we were doing, we were spot on for the May, uh, for the May run. And we were all correct. Like we, we called it. I remember Dave and I both bought those deep out the money, $40 call options, um, for like June 17th or something. And we, we bought them and we held almost all of them through expiration and uh it was uh it was a good time we uh man i think we sent our portfolios from like sub five thousand dollars up to like half a million at one point it was a pretty ridiculous time there were certainly good times back then yeah yeah (laughs) it was a volatile volatile time but i think that we're doing the same thing again which kind of brings me to the next point with amc so I predicted that these periods were the same with uh, AMC, but as I'm looking closer at the charts, I realized that these actually look more accurate. These two humps here, it had a run and a retrace, and it, retut- it retested support the same way that it did here back in late April, early May. And I can't believe, I couldn't believe it, but the chart is an exact copy of what it was back in, um, (laughs) this chart is an exact copy of its moves going from January all the way until May of last year. You had the first run, you had the first run, you had the first, uh, the first U, which is this one right here, the second retrace and the next uh, the next U, and then a long cup that led to uh, this rebound. It went from here to a low, and then made this one perfect. Uh, it's like a chevron, big long drop chevron. And now, if this is playing out accurately, then we might see in the next uh, couple of weeks AMC makes another test for. Probably, uh, probably thirty to forty dollars, then a retrace to thirty and a breakout, and then that would be the squeeze. If that actually plays out, then the timeline for the timeline for this would end right about the same time the first, uh, or right about the same time the June squeeze did. Right on, uh, right on June sixth or so, June seventh. Do you think? I mean, because of flow, I'm curious. Do you think because the flow was so much larger than the last time we squeezed that that will limit the amount we can squeeze by? Or um, we're so small enough to have not really have a bearing on it. It does have it does have an effect, I think, because it increases the availability of the shares, but it may not because of the uh because of the DTCC uh haircuts. So there's a lot of factors at play here, so I'm not sure. What I think is 
which is really, really damn good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, man. I said, I said, give me your best guess, which is damn good. Your, your guess has been a lot of people. My best guess, <clears throat> my best guess is that uh, if AMC apes that have been holding on for this long, like since since February of 2021 have been holding on through all of this shit. They're not going to let go of it. Once it surpasses $70, I think that the potential for it to squeeze could go far, far higher, especially because of the, uh, especially because of the DTCC haircuts. If the, this run that took place here, I suspect that this was a big liquidation event as a result of Archegos Capital. It happened right around the same time. Mm-hmm. Archegos went under because it had massive overleveraged short positions, which it did not have the collateral requirements necessary to uh, to meet its margin obligations, and they got margin called. And Bill yeah. Hong refused to pick up the phone and answer. And, <laughs> and it caused <laughs> Discovery why. to collapse. But Discovery collapsed after AMC ran. So what I think happened was AMC started running and the short positions for Bill Huang went under and he had to close those short positions, which caused the squeeze to go even further up to $70. And after that, then Discovery collapsed when he couldn't meet the margin calls. So all of his other assets were liquidated in order to... uh, recover the losses. Now, if this were to happen across the entire market, you think you think that Archegos had a big hedge fund. If this happened to Citadel, to Melvin Capital, or whoever the hell they are now, next, next, next month, I think. they're just rebranding. They're moving their money to a new name and just changing all together. Yeah. They're not going under. But if this happens, if this happens across the whole market, if the market, <laughs> yeah, if the whole market goes under, and AMC squeezes as a result of the those margin equity, excuse me, got the hiccups. If if AMC squeezes because the margin becomes too thin across the entire market, then AMC will force all shorts, naked or otherwise, to close their positions at market price because they're all going to be getting margin called. There's going to be assets closing against them and they're going to close their margin assets first. So if the market starts to drop, especially the housing market, AMC will start moving shortly after that as those margin uh, as those margin calls occur. After the margin calls occur, then you're going to see other assets, are all the hard equity assets across the rest of the market just collapse within days of AMC squeeze. Can and I, and well, GameStop is included. Like GameStop, AMC, ATER, anything that's been naked shorted right, to this we, extent yeah. is going to move. Do you know what percentage of like retailer use margin accounts? Because obviously there's the, the chart. There's, uh, there's probably, there's probably like cool. a 30 to 50% of them are on margin. But if they're holding on to assets that hold their equity, um, just because you're on a margin account doesn't necessarily mean that you lose it because retail but, is mostly yeah. buying assets against companies which have equity. And all the hedge funds that are holding equity against MBS, MBS is a very expensive security. And you're it's something that only banks and hedge funds tend to play in. You don't see retail buying MBS. The only thing is brokers make up their own margin requirement rules, of course. That's true. But if retail <laughs> so choose, I think that if you put retail in the position, especially for the majority of these holders, that even if they are on margin, if they were given the choice between washing out their AMC trades uh, by force by these guys, or if uh, or selling some of their other equities, they would sell the other equities first to keep their margin and uh, put their and back their AMC up in cash. As a matter of fact, mm. I'm considering placing my AMC shares under cash so that they cannot be used as margin equities. And that way, if 
anything else happens to my portfolio, no matter what, the broker cannot legally take my shares away from me for any reason, even if they are margined. Well, they yeah, wouldn't I've be got, margined I've got at that point. I've got a few different, got a few different accounts. I think I already have same, that. On interactive brokers, by the way, you can you you can um, if you right click on some uh, a stock in your portfolio, it, there's an option that says um, sell last, and if you you can select that for um, interesting, um, that, anything you set that on will be um, put to the back of the queue for liquidations. Should you get margin called? Interesting. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that I've I think that I've covered all of these. But does anybody have any questions on the major squeeze plays, the meme stocks, before I move on? Prague. Last one. Michael Burry or I guess I think a quick minute. Yeah, Michael Burry's calling a crash in the market too. I remember. We have a new member that's calling for Burks. SST and CRST. Yeah, the arcane. I was going to jump to his uh, request next, since these are actually already on the agenda. Okay, we'll go straight into that then. So BRQS is uh, setting up for another leg up, I think. Uh, let me go ahead and zoom into my charts here. There we go. Let's go on the 30 minute and zoom out a little. Okay. So BRQS, um, it looks like it's setting up for a new uh, a new leg up. That's my thinking. What is this? Oh, I have a ray set up. That's what's going on here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So if this is the new trend line that's been established, then we might see a breakdown below. Um, the uh, we we might keep consolidating, but I think that we're probably going to run to the tip of this wedge first and break up and out above thirty five cents. And at that point, I'll I'll say that we're safely re uh, uh, re entering our trend. I had set this channel, which was pretty uh, it was pretty tight channel. So and it was early on, so we're not entirely sure that this is what uh, BRQS is going to continue doing, but. I'm kind of optimistic that BRQS is going to stay on this channel. That's kind of what I'm thinking. The uh, the only thing with BRQS is that they have now increased some of the equity in the company on the uh, on the short term, and this is staying consistent. So they may see this as an opportunity to dilute on investors, but I don't know that they have anything on that in their uh, in their S1. So if they don't have any shares available to dilute, then they'll have to go through a shareholder vote. I have to read the filings to catch up on it, but I think that they have fully utilized their issuable shares, at least at the moment. The company is, fundamentally speaking, establishing some nice partnerships with Qualcomm, which is uh, it, it's an existing partner, actually. So not even establishing, they're just a partner. And now the, uh, now the company is getting ready to uh, start producing product for its partners. So there's like, we're likely to see some revenue coming into this stock, and that's going to generate speculation and interest. So in the short term, I see BRQS bouncing off of this trend and staying inside this channel for the time being. Shorts are continuously piling in at the peaks. So this is an this is a an opportunity to practice day trading I think if you're playing a stock like this this is a good time to buy and then you would sell it at the top of this channel and stick to this strategy um and just look for those opportunities try and capture uh try and capture like 80% of your shares capture profit and then uh, use that and you could short it on the way down or you can pick up more shares just at the bottom if you don't have margin or if you're just not comfortable shorting in general, um, and that's fine. You you have to be much more flexible if you choose to short. 
but as far as like the uh, as far as like big major moves in BRQS, there is a lot of short interest against it that's built up over the short term. Um, BRQS. Let's get this up on Ortex. My short interest has just been rising steadily. It peaked up here and then sold off at the end of the week. So short interest of the free float was 1% here, and at this maximum it was at 3.5%. So short interest is still accumulating here. But if shorts keep entering as the price goes higher and higher, that's the situation that GameStop had. Um, GameStop was a situation where shorts had taken a big position against the stock for a long time ago, waiting for the company to go bankrupt. And when that started to go against them, the stock... Uh, became more liquid on the options market. So uh, shorts kept piling in, kept piling in, kept piling in. And then when the price kept rising and rising because retail took an interest in the stock, um, then the company, uh, the company's options market became more liquid. So the short sellers bought big in the money puts against it and created a big block of equity that was sitting at a, uh, on puts. And when the price kept rising and put those puts out of, out of the money, their equity evaporated. So that caused the uh, that caused the short seller to have to make a decision whether to cover their shorts or to double down again. But there were no shorts to double down with, so they just chose options again, and they put more money down on puts that were deep in the money. And again, those went out of the money as the price continued rising. So I see the same potential here for stocks like BRQS, though more recently I've been giving RDBX more credit for this. Uh, BRQS is one that I think could become a, uh, a over-leveraged stock as shorts continue piling into it uh, while retail continues accumulating, but that's a long shot. For BRQS, I'm just kind of day trading it because it's not one of those high conviction stocks that, uh, that I think that retail will jump into uh and hold on to because they like just believe in the company it's not one of those companies it's it's a foreign company it's in the chinese market it is in a highly desirable um space and they are very niche in their business so they don't have much competition but at the same time like it's not it's not like GameStop or or Redbox because there's a nostalgia factor and people are attached to it. Same way with AMC, people are attached to movie theaters. You're not going to find a big a big group of retailers that are going to look at BRQS and like, hell yeah, I love embedded technology. I'll hold forever. It's not likely to happen. So BRQS is one that I see the opportunity, and I'd say you know day trade it as you can. Market makers are over leveraging themselves and and they're getting punished for it and shorts keep piling in, but eventually there will be an equilibrium where it will consolidate and then probably either more attention to the, from the bulls will push it up higher or the shorts will overwhelm it and it will fall back down and retrace in its value. At the moment, it's in the uptrend. I believe in following the trend. Uh, SST. So SST short interest is getting ridiculous again. Um, you have to kind of ignore the uh, estimate of free float because the shorts are still over leveraging themselves and the float is still small. I think that this figure is even underestimating it based on some information that I've received by people that are paying much closer attention. Propicalia, if you're in here, thank you for um, pointing some of this out to me. But uh, the short interest i believe is against a free float of maximum 7 million shares the um the cost to borrow actually reflects this because the stock has been over it's been heavily utilized for geez like since uh since 
late January, early February. And with the price moving up like this, like this is what I imagine BRQS doing, by the way. Like this is an example, BRQS just hitting a top and then getting hammered by shorts and then making a decision whether to rise against shorts and put them truly under or to collapse. This was the this was the make or break decision point for uh, SST. Now what I think is going on with SST is that the um is that the shorts have doubled down on their positions with the uh with the stock basically finding an equilibrium. So this was a big this was a big moment where the stock could squeeze but it got hammered uh by dilution. And now this offering is holding it steady. Now the question is Will the dilution be overtaken and will bulls overwhelm and put the shorts under again? Because right now the shorts are still under. They are still very much under. Most of the shorts have been uh most of the shorts have been in their positions since back down here at like ten dollars. If the uh if the price of this stock continues to find equilibrium at fifteen dollars and it holds that level for a longer period of time as shorts continue to pile in meaning that bulls are still scooping up shares and evaporating that offering then this one can also squeeze especially when you take a look at the gamma ramp on it so i'll go ahead and get that going cook this one up all right so Again, we have to remember that the, the float has increased a little bit. Uh, this is not showing an accurate uh, description of the float right now. But if we multiply uh, or if we divide these percentages by about mm, by about seven, we get a, or no, like four. So at... $12 where this thing is currently sitting there's 7% of the float in the money according to this like skewed float figure um, and all the way up here at 19 there's 250 so let's go ahead and take that figure 250% divided by 7 we get 35.7% of the float just if we base it off of the difference between the current float which I'm estimating is at 7% uh, million and the float that uh, Scourgebot is using because our data provider sucks, it's estimating a 1.5 million float. So we have to take the difference um, and then divide by that difference, and then you get 35% of the uh, you get 35% of the float in the money at 19 dollar strike, roughly. It's very hard to do this estimate, so this is extremely rough math. Please, you know, do do your own checks and balances on this one, um, just to make sure that I haven't done something wrong. <clears throat> but in any case, uh, <sighs> SST is one that I actually think could be another squeeze candidate, at the very least a gamma squeeze. But the shorts are way over leveraged on this one. They they really put themselves up against the wall. I'm wondering if uh, if they're going to be the next ones to get hit with their margin margin equity drying up. There's a huge amount of leverage on May twentieth. Um, Fifteen dollar strikes are pretty juicy. Market makers want this below thirteen, um, ideally below twelve and a half if they can push it there. But <clears throat> the uh, the speculation at retail, the, you could tell this is retail buying the extremely dumb cheap ones. Honestly, like this this kind of <laughs> this kind of gamma ramp is frustrating because I know that this is a bunch of retailers that are picking something that's like almost guaranteed not to happen most of the gamma ramp is way down here and it has to accumulate down here for this to be possible um the, more than anything 20. what's that for 20 dollar for may 20 yeah that's what i'm saying the 20 dollar for may 20 Ugh. yeah so 
<clears throat> in order for all of these to go in the money, it, it, that's a tall order. That's a very tall order. It can happen, but it's it's very unlikely. You could see the market makers are affecting max pain on this thing. They dropped it down below thirteen dollars just in time for uh, just in time for the end of uh, last Friday. So all of these expired worthless. And if people keep buying these dumb out the money options, then they're going to make these expire worthless too. Shorts are holding this thing down. Market makers are stepping on its neck. Honestly, retail needs to stop buying the options for this one. Let the gamma ramp hold and just buy the shares. Buying the shares right now is what will push the price up against them and keep the market maker from being able to shove it down. Um, but that only helps insofar as if they buy it directly from the exchange and they don't go through a middleman. If they buy through um, through middle uh, through a middleman like a market maker or a internalized or broker dealer then they're just handing their liquidity over and giving money through the spread, the payment for order flow. Exactly. Num, thank you. The payment for order flow is directly going to the broker and to the market maker who are trying to shove the price down. So all that you're doing, if you're not buying this directly from the exchange with a directed market order, is you're handing that liquidity over to somebody who wants to try and punish your, you for taking a bullish position on this stock. And if retail continues to make this mistake, which I'm sure it will, then these are going to expire worthless too. This is a big gamble at this point. So if you believe in this thing and you want to help push it in your favor, you got to buy shares. Buying the options at this point, it adds gas to the fire, but there's nobody there's nobody burning matches. You know, you got to actually bring the fire to the gas. The this this stock has to stay above fifteen dollars for this to have the effect that we want to see. So share buying has to happen here. Um, let's cover a few no, more. What's up, Dave? Uh, can I ask you about? I'm just, I've just been reading through the, some of the uh, filings for BRQS. Um, I'm looking. At... Okay. Um. <laughs> what filings? Dave's not here. Hmm. Oh, look, there's TDR Sorry. Capital taking a passive Sorry. investment against them. Sorry, I forgot I had to hold my thing down. So oh. as, a foreign, as a foreign issuer, they are exempt under the Exchange Act from, among other things, the rules prescribing the furnishing and content of proxy statements and our executive officers, directors, and principal shareholders are exempt from the reporting and short swing profit recovery positions contained in section 16 of the Exchange Act. I don't know what that section 16 contains. But oh, so they are allowed to the, short against their own stock. They're allowed to short their company. Is that what it's saying? That's it says, in addition, we will not be required under the Exchange Act to file periodic reports and financial statements with the SEC as frequently or as promptly as U.S. companies whose securities are registered under the Exchange Act. Because they're foreign. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So if they are, if they're in this position, then that means that they can absolutely short the company. They can play, they can take a short position against themselves, which that's, I feel like that should outright be illegal no matter what, but the SEC can't enforce that since they're a foreign entity. So if, uh, and that would also, that may also apply to their partners, TDR Capital, who's providing these passive investments. Um, and if you don't recognize this name, you should, because these guys were involved in Mullen and they were part of the group that Asusa was providing shares to. Uh, during the dilution periods. So every time that Asusa diluted, TDR Capital was one of those companies that were sold to. And the uh, individual, Tim Davis, this uh, this guy comes up frequently. He's also a, um, he, he's also a shady character that uh, has been involved in several, quote, um, pump and dump schemes. He's been... Uh, He's been cited for racketeering. He's been involved in racketeering prosecution cases uh, on the defense. So there's a lot of there's a lot of 
there, there's a lot of bad press following this guy. He he gets involved in some shady dealings. So I'm thinking that BRQS, if it makes another move up, then Shorts will Shorts might try and turn this one around and push it back down below again. I don't know if this is some kind of a scheme between these entities and market makers or broker dealers or what the hell is going on or if this is like some big scam from a Chinese company. I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to capture the value where I see it. Um, but reading this and seeing his name, Timothy Davis, in here gives me uh, Timothy Davis Rice. It, it, seeing his name makes me nervous. Um, realizing that TDR Capital is involved in this gets me a little bit, a little bit nervous. So I'm gonna I, if if I get rid of my BRQS position, I will of course let everybody know. I will disclose that, but. Uh, for right now, I'm holding it, and I'm going to see what it does in the morning. At the moment, I'm Maybe. expecting it to make another leg up, but we'll see what happens tomorrow. Was Timothy? He was the one on the last. Uh, he, he was the one on the last 13G, yeah. For Mullen or for Borks? Oh, so, sorry. I thought, I thought you were talking about BRQS. Too. I am talking about BRQS, but I. Mullen was involved. Uh, it was just in the last 13G for the RQS. Right. They sold the maximum that they um, exercised the, ma the maximum number of warrants. Like the, the, the two guys, I can't remember the names, okay. um, at 9.99% ownership. But they've still got like about 8 million shares, uh, or 8 million. Um, sh shares worth of warrants each. Okay. Um, yeah. What what was the exercise price for those warrants? Does I have that in there anywhere? I'll have a look. Or BRQS. Yeah. I thought the first ones were at sixty five. Hmm. All right. Well, anyway, um, if you get the if you get the number on those warrants for sure, Dave, let me know. We'll go ahead and update it. Uh, for the time being, I think I'm just going to jump into uh, jump into the next ticker. Uh, we need to talk about BBIG. Actually, BBIG was interesting, um, and we should also talk about ATER. I'll cover ATER first, actually, since it's part of our big squeeze picks. Um, ATER is starting to show some major accumulation here on its charts. The So this last big move for ATER doesn't really count. The, uh, the one that started August in 2021, this is the one that matters. The the big jump up and a huge drop in the OBV was the first signal for ATER, and it did it again. So there were two big legs for the OBV on ATER. The biggest one was when it made its move to... Here, let me go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit. If you look at these two big moves, you see a big spike here in the OBV here on the 27th of August, and then a drop down below. So we had that same thing happen here on the 4th of April, big drop down low in the OBV, and then another leg up in consolidation in the OBV before it squeezed really big. I think this is what's happening again. It looks a little bit different, but it's still, it's still the same lineup of events. So if ATER is about to make another leg up, then I think that it will be on par with some of these types of moves. If we are in the midst of if we're in the midst of this tail, just like this, then the first move is already completed. That was this jump from here to here. It was a 150% move from 
four dollars till what does this say? Till ten dollars. So from four to ten. And this would have gone from yeah, this is about the same. It's from two to seven. So rather identical, rather identical move by the numbers, about a 200% gain. So that first move is completed, and if we zoom in on this, we see it sells off, jumps up, and then sells again, and then establishes another leg before it cups and breaks up. So that's where I'm thinking that this is about to start making a move towards like $8, $10, and then then the squeeze can really occur. Um, ATER has a pretty over-leveraged options chain as well, so that's going to play a significant part of this. The options chain on ATER is perhaps what gives it the most uh, power to move, as well as the fact that its float is extremely low. It's only, a th um, it's only what is this, according to trading view... The shares on the float are only 53 million plus change. So that's easily consumable by the uh, by retail. Retail can quite easily lock up a float of 53 million shares. Now, ATER is puts that are way over leveraged. Are ex they already expired last week. Most of them expired worthless. Take also the calls. We had quite a few of them that expired uh, worthless here above uh, above five dollars. But since these expired in the money, most of the equity in ATER calls below five dollars is still there. So even though the five and a half and six dollars and above expire worthless this week, that's okay. ATER is still holding its uh, is still holding its position here, and uh, it has not followed Max Payne, which is the biggest. That's the biggest deviation. Is that the Max Payne for puts was felt, but not for calls? Ideally, market makers would have wanted the price to expire just below five dollars, so that at these sets of puts would have been in the money, but the five dollar calls for ATER would have expired out of the money, and that would have been the closer max pain. But since ATER, I suspect the float is locked up and the utilization for short shares is completely locked up. So that puts ATER on the path to a rapid ascension for a gamma squeeze. Um, additionally, since we've got the biggest amount of leverage on ATER is in uh, on May 20th, with a huge amount of calls in the money at $5. The equity here is good. These still have equity, uh, delta, intrinsic value. If the price can move up to $6 in the next week, then I'm thinking that before May 20th, most of these can run in the money. $10, if this went in the money and the equity was, uh, and the equity increased on these because delta rose as these went further in the money, then the gamma squeeze would be secured. And at this point, the uh, the open interest on these farther out the money options will start filling up. And at some point, market makers are going to find the top and they'll be able to sell calls at this level somewhere like 20, 25 or so, depending on how high ATER goes. But we'll see what happens. ATER, I think, is going to be the first one to squeeze. It's the most. It's the one that's the most set up and has already established a clear trend where it's moving up in support of a squeeze. So the moves that it's making right now support the theory. I'm running out of time here, guys, so I think I'm not going to be able to get to the other tickers. Um, let me go ahead and just uh, cover this really quickly. So ATER, I'm expecting the next leg uh, to break up to about $7 again. If it can break $7, then that's your, that's your signal. Gain 
you think BBIG real quick, TD? Yeah, I can try and get that one. I'll do BBIG and then I got to go. Sorry, guys. I won't be able to get to RDBX, but that one is also a confident squeeze. Um, retail still needs to be in accumulation phase. Um, BBIG needs to break out of the uh, 275 level for me to uh, feel that confidence. 275, because it's a signal that the $3 calls can run in the money. And also, it'll be starting to establish higher lows. BBIG is also making PR announcements regularly. So that's also a sign that interest will start coming back into the stock. We just got to give it time. Uh, RDBX, I'm going to encourage you guys to look at this one on Ortex, and you just let the numbers speak for themselves. But the moves up to $6 in, uh, in, at the end of the day in post-market trading, that was, uh, that was big money right there. RDBX has uh, got more than 50% of its float shorted. And there's no dilution on the table. The dilutive instruments that are there are warrants, which are pre-funded, and they are not going to be eligible for exercise for at least uh, at least several months. Um, but I think it was a year. Somebody will have to go back through the filings to double check me on that and make sure they're keeping me honest. But RDBX is set up for the squeeze the best out of any of the uh, tickers besides ATER. I think ATER is set up for combined gamma short squeeze because of the heavy over leveraging of ATER um, with it being uh, yeah, 41% of the float. And you've got the CEO that's actively fighting shorts, which is something you like to see. BBIG is in a similar position, although the uh, short interest is not quite as high. Um, so BBIG, I think, is going to need to take some time, but it's about ready to start establishing its uptrends. And then when it starts to move up, shorts always hit it at the top. Whenever they think that there's weakness, they'll start hitting it. So that's an opportunity to capture some profits and then consolidate your uh, liquidity. If you see BBIG break out like $3, $4 or so and look for the shorts to make a big entry, that's the time to either exit the positions or lock in some profit and wait for the consolidation to happen and then take another position. BBIG is, it, it could move parabolic just out of nowhere. It's done it plenty of times before, like here, for example. It has done it before, um, but it's never a guarantee. So if you want to play it smart, you can try and see where the shorts come in at the top, capture those profits, and then wait for a dip. Or um, you could do what I'm doing, which I just bought the July 15th calls, and uh, I'm I'm waiting for it to make its big parabolic move. I think it's going to happen before July easily. Okay. Um, I think that's going to cover it for me. And, uh, well, I will leave you with the, uh, with the RDBX chart just so that you can actually see it for yourselves. See, 50%, not, not making this up. The shorts are piling in and they're not getting, <laughs> they're not, their positions are not getting any better. Almost all of them are below $2 in their entry, and they've been trying to pile in to get it under control ever since then, but they're like 300% underwater now. They're really, really screwed. So if RDBX keeps setting up to move like this, it's already filled the gap here to $6. If it keeps going, then you might see a parabolic SPRT style squeeze. All right, that's it for me, guys. I have run out of time. Uh, thanks so much for stopping by and uh, being a part of the meeting with me. Um, just a uh, reminder: we're going to start. We're going to discuss moving the schedule for this. We're looking at 1 p.m. Eastern time, just to make it easier for everybody to attend, and so that the analysts that are overseas uh, on um, in the UK and such will be able to uh, will be able to attend more easily. And it'll be better for me too, because it, it'll be in my mornings. So uh, my Sunday morning is a lot easier for me to attend these as well. So maybe I'll be able to show up to a few more of them. Um, that's it. It was a pleasure having you guys. I hope you were able to get some good information out of this. I will post the recording of this on YouTube uh, later 
uh, in the it'll be tomorrow morning at least two hours before the market bell if I can get this edited in time. Thanks again so much. I'll see you guys later.